well, just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean that it needs to be the way. Instead, because when you're a leader, a senior leader, you can just give people the answers to the test. Okay, but what you're doing is you're robbing them of professional development. Right. Instead, you need to ask questions that make them think. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them where you want them to be or where you wish you had been at that level as a platoon sergeant. I wish I had been thought about this, you know, this way earlier. And instead, you know, so it, what what I tried to do when I was in, you know, in senior level is, is asking questions, putting scenarios in front of them that made them go, okay, I've always done it this way. But now with a little bit of an innovative thought, I can actually completely change the paradigm. And now what develops on the backside is something that's completely amazing yeah. and way better than I ever would have anticipated. You know, and then it comes into this conversation. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rapid fire here. You gave oh, me coffee. You gave me coffee. All right. This is your fault. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, is this conversation about, you know, evolutionary thought for, re versus revolutionary thought. And if you're just evolving, it's good, but you're always, you have to come to the realization, you're always gonna match the level that you need to be at. Right. You're gonna match the enemy where they're at, where you're at, and it's just, you're, it, you might fall behind at times, but you're never really gonna actually be out ahead of it. And what's amazing about the Ranger Regiment and what, you know, and it took us a little while, but eventually where we got was we were revolutionary in thought. Welcome to the Leading with Vulnerability podcast. I'm your host, Yuma Barnett. And today, my guest is Mike Burke. Uh, he's a retired command sergeant major with 24 years of service to our to our nation. He's also a husband, a father, and a fellow content creator, and has a podcast that he that he runs, Legends of the 75th. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. But I'm not going to monopolize the mic here. I'm going to pass it over to Mike. Uh, <laughs> let him introduce himself, and we'll get on with the conversation. First, I just want to say that you can tell that it's cold because we're both wearing vests. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's cold here in yeah. Georgia. No, hey, uh, Yuma, absolutely honored to uh, come on the podcast. Uh, I, I love everything that you're doing um, with, you know, Leading with Vulnerability podcast. Um, you know, just a little bit about me, you know, just like you said, 24 years of service. Uh, I spent 17 years of it in the 75th Ranger Regiment, all of it in 275. So I'm a left coast kind of guy. Yep. I know. Don't judge me for that. Um, but uh, explains the hair, you know, the <laughs> long <right>. hair. <laughs> um, and uh, actually, it was a sideburns. That's what when that's, the when the hair standard changed. That's what everybody in 275 was known for. Yep. And I and I attribute that to Bernie Felino. But yep. anyway, tangent there. Oh, that's a whole story we could have a, a whole show we could have on Bernie Felino. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, and and credit to the first person that ever gets him to actually sit down on a podcast. And I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> But, uh, um, yeah, you know, and I spent some time also teaching ROTC and then, uh, you know, the last bulk of my career, uh, outside of the 75th Ranger Regiment and, uh, second Cavalry Regiment and then first SVAB, uh, down at Fort Benning, you know, now Fort Moore. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much a majority of my career in a nutshell. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's putting it very mildly there. That's a very good, you know, very humble explanation of what you've done, you've done and what you were doing. And we're going to, I'm going to peel the onion back and we're going to get All deeper right, into good. it. But we're going to start it off with the first question I ask everybody that comes on the show. And uh, what's your definition of vulnerability? Yeah, you know, before I define it, I do have a story uh, about it. I first heard your podcast. I was still in Germany about you doing a podcast, you know, on, uh, you know, social media is where I think I saw you posted or something. And I was like, oof, leading with vulnerability, 75th Ranger Regiment old fucking move. <laughs> like, man, that's going to be tough. Um, but, you know, at the exact same time, you know, just like you, I've been reaching, you know, reading, you know, Benny Brown, you know, all the vulnerability stuff and everything. And so I was also, also, you know, going through this, my own thought process with what does the word vulnerability mean? And leading with it, you know, what does that really mean? And, and, and so to answer your question more directly is, it is a it is a position a perceived position of weakness when you lead with vulnerability or being vulnerable but the truth of it is and what i've realized now is that you're o you can only actually operate in a very solid position of strength by being vulnerable right. because in order to be vulnerable that means that you've stripped yourself down to your core and you've actually 
had the hard conversations with yourself and other people and other experts and everything to realize what makes you tick, what makes you, you, then you can use that to um to jumpstart conversations to be a better leader because you can relate with people better you know you might not have an exact situation that somebody's going through because at the end of the day leadership's about leading people and people inherently have problems they have issues they have all these different things that they're going through and if because you understand yourself and when you've been at your most vulnerable and the things that kind of make you tick then you can basically jumpstart those conversations and say I don't know exactly what you're going through, but here's something that I've went through as well that puts me in a position similar to yours. Now let's work together to solve whatever kind of complex problem we're trying to solve in your life. Yeah, Uh, I agree. Great, great definition. You're right. (laughs) When I named this podcast, uh, I did it on purpose because I thought if I named it that, the people who needed it were going to come to it. Oh, yeah. uh, Okay. um, Because it's uncomfortable to even read it and say it, especially from people of our background. So I was hoping it would it would resonate with the right people uh, right off the bat. So, uh, and it's been a challenge and a journey, as you well know, doing doing Mm. your own thing. Yeah. Uh, But I love what you say there about vulnerability. I think when I, the same thing, when I kind of peeled the onion back and looked at the definition of vulnerability, I realized that being vulnerable was the best way for me to relate with other people and get them. Yes. Yeah. If I noticed a subordinate or somebody that worked for me was having a hard time, if I was shared a vulnerable story with them, I was they were more apt to open up and really tell me what was going on and we could get to the root of the problem. So I think it's uh, all encompassing vulnerability, how it can help define you and help you as a leader. So uh, great definition. I, I love hearing those definitions. It's, it's probably my favorite part of the whole podcast. But moving on. You joined the army a few years ago, right? Yeah, a few years ago. Right? Yeah. Uh, if you just say it in your mind, you know, 1998, 98, 98, yeah, it doesn't nice. sound far off. But when you do the math, <sighs> the old math, math wins every time. And that was Good a few Lord. years ago, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, so why did you choose the army? Uh, what's that kind of story? The 75th, was that, you know, do you have a contract for it? Uh, what was that? And then the second part is uh, it was pre-9-11. Mm. Uh, so it was a yeah. different military back then. I got a small taste of it. Um, so uh, what was it like there in 9-11 and uh, what's your army story? Yeah, my army story. Yeah, 1998 definitely doesn't sound that long ago, but good Lord, yeah, man, it, it, it's amazing to kind of sit here and think about. You know, my my reason for joining the army was part, uh, you know, inspiration. I did have an uncle that was in the military. He did serve a, a very brief stint in the 75th Ranger Regiment. Um you know, and I come from, you know, nothing, you know, like, you know, when I define nothing, I mean, you know, very, very poor, um, you know, very difficult background, very difficult childhood. I struggled the entire time I was a child. Um, you know, I never really could find my people. Um, I could never really kind of find what my purpose was. I mean, I worked my ass off, you know, I had, you know, at one time, I think I had three or four different jobs. Um, part, you know, is just because I wanted my own money, but to, you know, you know, supplement and, you know, the family income and everything else. Um, and I'd always had this thought about joining the military. You know, it always was alluring to me, you know, the, the, the close knit nature of it, you know, everything that we see in the movies, you know, like I wanted to be part of something that was bigger than myself with people that I could look up to, you know, that could be mentors of mine and, uh, you know, kind of heroes. Uh, but then, you know, I was about 17 and I've told this story like a few times, but I was 17 years old. I was at a kegger, you know, just like all us high school kids are back then. And I just remember like, you know, I don't claim to be incredibly intelligent, but I just remember that I had like this epiphany moment where all these 20, 21 year old dudes were coming to this party and they were trying to hit on the girls we were partying with, you know? And, and, you know, I just remember being like, wait, what the F? Like, why are they here? Don't they have like somewhere better to be? Like you're 20 years old, man. Like, why are you not the 21 years old? Why are you not at a bar? Like, why are you hanging out with high school kids? Yeah. And then it just like quickly went, if I don't change my circumstance, I'm going to be just like these guys. They all work on the oil rigs. They work for their farm buddy or dad or dad's buddy or uncle or something like that. Work as a ranch hand, you know, whatever it is, that's all there is in Montana. And I'm not 
complaining about any of that. I'm not dogging in anybody that does that. It's honest work. It's great work. But I just knew that I wanted more. Right. And the military was the quickest way to do it. Uh, college was not an option. I was a terrible student. I hated school. I barely, you know, made it through school. Um, you know, I was not very disciplined. I was doing all kinds of stupid shit as a kid. Um, you know, so the military was the option. Uh, I knew the 75th. I went to the recruiter. Uh, you know, I will say my recruiter, you know, he was he wasn't the greatest recruiter. He was <laughs> drunk pretty much the whole time, but he was a good researcher. Just came for the he, high school party. Yeah, yeah, probably <laughs> did. He probably did. But uh, he, you know, he did do his research and he said, hey, listen, man, you know, you're probably not going to get a Ranger contract, but don't worry. We just need to get you an airborne, airborne contract. And then when you're there, they'll come around and you can, you know, volunteer for the 75th Ranger Regiment. I was like, okay, you know, that made sense to me. I had a little bit of struggle at MAPS, you know, they didn't want to give me a contract for 11 Bravo and, you know, Airborne and all that stuff. Uh, but it was quickly remedied when I threatened to go and, you know, and I talked to the gunny that was in the Marine Corps, you know, they quickly found the things they needed to find and boom, you know, show up to Fort Benning, Georgia. Yeah. And uh, I just remember, you know, and I always tell this story because now I live in Georgia. So right. I always laugh about it. You know, I stepped off the plane. It was my first time in the South. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. Like, it is too hot. It was June of 1998. I was like, there is no way I can live through this. How do human beings live in this kind of weather, you know? And, uh, you know, but it was fine, you know, drank a lot of water, took a knee, you know, and, uh, you know, made it, made it through it. Um, but my pre 9-11 and unfortunately, and, you know, I've, I've talked about this a lot and now obviously because, you know, I run a podcast, uh, where I talk to people and I ask them very similar question. Why did you choose the army? Why did you choose the 75th? Uh, I did not have a good experience. Uh, my first leadership in, in Ranger Regiment was, was terrible, um, you know, bad team leaders, bad squad leader. Platoon Sergeant was an interesting guy. Um, but uh, I didn't really enjoy it. Um, and I came back from Ranger School and I was kind of jaded. Yeah. Um, I did make it through Ranger School. I mean, I will say that, you know, my platoon sergeant really did me a solid. He was frustrated at the entire platoon because all the privates were failing the PT test. Uh, you know, guys were injured, you know, all this different kind of stuff. And, you know, one day, literally after yelling at all the squad leaders, he came out of the hallway and he said, I'm going to pick the next guy that's going to go take the Ranger School PT test. I'm done letting you squad leaders pick because you guys are just messing this up. Right. And just in that moment, I was perfectly holding the iron chair, you know, <laughs> like, you know, I just happened to be perfect in that, that split second. And he said, Burke, you're taking the PT test. And, uh, you know, it proceeded to be one of the worst weekends of my life. Uh, you know, physical abuse, you know, mental abuse, you know, hazing, you know, because basically, you know, the team leader, squad leaders, spec fours, everybody in the platoon was like, you, you are one of the most junior guys. Um, you're not going, you're not going to pass this PT test. And, you know, that was where I learned the first, you know, kind of lesson that you can literally do anything you put your mind to. Right. I did not go into that Ranger School PT test with my mind in the right place, but there was a shift right before I took, you know, I, I did the push-ups. Um, you know, my shoulder was dislocated, you know, like I was just having all these, you know, I was just, I was jacked up. I was messed up and I was hung over because <laughs> after this giant smoke fest all the weekend long, I did what any Ranger private's going to do. I got smashed, right. you know, but, uh, you know, I pulled it out. Um Probably, you know, I don't know what the score is, but probably had one of the best PT tests of my life, you know, <laughs> like did phenomenal and, uh, you know, made it through Ranger School. And things did start to shift when I got back from Ranger School. However, I was very jaded. Yeah. Uh, my, my, my mind frame was not in the right place. And that's on me. That is, I do not blame anybody for that. That is, you are, you are in charge of your own mentality and how you look at the world and the mental energy that you put out in the world is your responsibility and no one else's. There's outside influences, but you're, it's your, it's on you to process them and, you know, do what you will with them. And, uh, but it all really kind of changed 2001 prior to September 11th, you know, Josh Wheeler came from, cause they basically fired like the whole platoon. Uh, well, I was actually at PLDC, uh, a very funny kind of story there, but they basically fired the whole platoon. And, uh, so they restructured the entire company, BCO 275. And, uh, we got the, I got this new squad leader named Josh Wheeler. And in the matter of months, like six months, this guy completely just changed my life. He showed me what leadership was. He showed what it meant to care about your men, care about your soldiers, 
you know, doing the right thing, setting standards, setting expectations, training. You know, you used to always have these things. You'd like, you know, every time we do PT, we're going to do it like it's the last time we're going to do it before we go to combat. You know, every time we train, it's like the last time we're going to train before we go to combat. You know, you just had all these little tenants that, yeah. you know, stuck with me, you know, now, you know, many, many years later. And so, you know, and then September 11th happened and everybody's mentality changed, yeah. you know, and the focus, the purpose, what we were doing as a nation, as a Ranger regiment, you know, it all changed. And I was, you know, you fast forward to, you know, after that first deployment, you know, I'm like, man, I can't do, I'm not going to do anything different with my yeah. life. This is who I'm meant to be. And this is what I'm meant to do, yeah. you know, because I finally had found that thing I'd been looking for, for all, you know, at that point, almost 20 plus years, which was a sense of belonging, yeah. people that I loved, um, you know, and, and, and brothers that I would do anything for, you know, cause I'd never really kind of had that in my whole life. Right. Right. Yeah. That, that's a amazing story. And I think there's a lot there we could talk about. Um, the, the, the 75th Ranger Regiment was a different place pre nine 11. It, it was. was just different. Uh, I remember there was, a, it seemed to me as a private, you know, there was just a lot of anger and hostility mm -hmm. in the barracks. Yeah. Uh, a yeah. lot of tent up aggression, you know, yeah. pent up aggression because it had been a long time since anybody had been to the show. Yeah. Right. Especially 275. Yeah. And yep. we trained for the show very hard, you know, yes. back in those days. You you left the, you went to the field on Tuesday, you yep. came back on Friday. You know the deal. It was, it was different. It was hard. Hazing was just part of life. Like I didn't call it hazing. I just called it Tuesday. Uh, yeah, you know, right. You just, you know, stand in the bar stand in the hallway, get golf balls hit at you, get in your mop suit, go turn the dryers on and do push ups until you, you couldn't anymore. Yep. Uh I'm not mad about it. That's yeah. just the way it was. Right? It just was. Uh, uh, yep. But I think it it uh it had to change. You know, uh, that's one of the the good things I think that came out of 9 11 is it yep. made the 75th mature. We had something else to focus yeah, on. Mature yeah. as an organization because uh if we didn't, we weren't gonna be do the great things we did for 20 years. And and that kind of brings me to the next point is you know, you saw the 75th and the army evolve over the GWAT. Yeah. Uh as many lives as we lost and as much time as all of us spent away from our families, uh a lot of good came from the global war on terrorism yeah, uh, as far absolutely. as organizational growth and, and what we did. I just, I want you to hit on that a little bit, what, what you saw there, how you saw the 75th evolve. And then in your time in the army, how you kind of saw it, it evolve as well. You know, one thing that a lot of, you know, there's a, people talk about this, you know, there's a lot of conversations that exist around this, but there's one thing that, you know, I've only seen actually talked about a couple of times and, um, you know, only, and I, I can't speak for the army by and large. Um, I can't necessarily even speak about the rest of the 75th, but I can talk about 275 is, you know, just like you were talking about, there was no real sense of purpose, you know, okay. You know, we used to run around singing cadences, yeah. you know, say anybody, everybody give me a war. Hey, you yeah. know, like all this different kind of stuff, but there was no war, you yeah. know, there was nothing, you know, there was a jump, you know, a couple jumps, you know, we missed out on desert storm. Uh, you know, only a small element participated in Mogadishu. There wasn't a lot there, you know, and there was, there was a lot of anger. There was a lot of frustration and then nine 11 happened. And then all of a sudden what happened needed to happen. Right. All those people that were full of bravado, all those people that were like, yeah, let's have a war, you know, let's go to war. All of a sudden, they weren't there. They were gone. And the it's 275, I mean, I remember my platoon went from like fully manned squads, a 14-man freaking yeah, right. uh, weapon squad right. to all of a sudden we're like, I mean, my first deployment, I think there was five of us in my squad. Yeah. First squad, you know, two, uh, two Bravo. Like everybody left. Everybody got out of the army any way that they possibly could. They got out of Ranger Regiment. Yeah. And what and what's important about that is that's exactly what needed to happen. Yeah. We didn't need those people. They were in the army for the wrong reason, you know. And it's something that I've talked about, you know, a little bit is, you know, now looking out in the military – you know, and some of the problems that are going on with the military, and I'm not sitting there trying to be the old guy, the old beard guy, you know, that talks about, uh, you know, all those, you know, here's all the problems with the army. But the truth is, is we've forgot yep. a lot of what the hell the army exists for. And it's to defeat and destroy and detour the enemies of our country. And if our any of our aims are not focused on that, then we're in the wrong place. Right. But anyway, you know, back to, you know, your point specifically, it. All of a sudden, everybody got hyper-focused 
And the people that were coming into the army, coming into Ranger Regiment, they were coming in because of September 11th. They, you know, they were NFL quarterbacks. They had yeah. master's degrees. They were right. doctors. They were all these different kind of people that had this call to patriotism and wanted to be, you know, part of an elite organization. So they came to 75th. So the entire organization shifted and yeah. our mentality shifted. And then we watched, you know, from, you know, O2, you know, O3, you know, with the invasion of Iraq and we showed what we could do in Iraq. You know, we had the whole goddamn regiment there yeah. and we were hunting, you know, the deck of cards, doing direct action missions, doing all these different raids. Hey, we don't need to be in a support role for, you know, uh, you know, Big Brother or the Squids or anything like that. We can do what they're doing as well. And we did it all over the country, you know, helicopters, planes, you know, airfield seizures, Cessnas, like any way that we could do it, we found a way to do yeah, it yeah. Um, because we didn't have a lot of assets. We made it all happen. And, you know, and then, you know, General McChrystal coming in, you know, and you start to talk about 04, 05 and Hey, we need to, we got Afghanistan going on. We got Iraq going on. We need to pressure, you know, put pressure on the network. You know, that was the thing that was always talked about. And in an effort to do that, we need more strike forces. We need more people doing what was once thought only a certain units could do while we have this whole regiment of individuals that can do it. And they can do it really, really well. Right. And that just allowed us to step into the role and actually be part of the community, not a support part of the community, an actual, hey, left and right, you hit this building, we're hitting this building, we're hitting it with, you know, foreign partners, you know, their special forces organizations, you know, everybody, and we're, and we're just making it happen. And oh, by the way, we got really good at it, yeah, like phenomenal at it. And we were able to keep up the momentum that General McChrystal, you know, uh, really wanted to kind of happen, proved ourselves not that we didn't have missteps. Of course we did. But we also found out at the same time, those other units were having missteps as well. They That's were right. doing stupid things, you know. Um, but by and large, we could really kind of make it happen. Um, and it was a phenomenal thing to be a part of. And, you know, I wish I wish somebody had told us, hey, you are literally part of yeah. probably the most important part of Ranger history. Yeah. Like, journal it better, <laughs> write about it more, yeah, you know, right, yeah. because people are going to want to know about this, yeah. you know, and people are going to want to talk about this. And it's just amazing, you know, how many things of little nuanced things that we've kind of forgot about yeah. that happened during those times. Um, and it was, you know, it was, uh, and with that new re redefined purpose, we found our way and we found our identity. And you look at what Ranger Regiment's responsible for and what they've done and, you know, the closure of Afghanistan and how, you know, the 75th really led the charge on that, you yeah. know, um, you know, it, you know, we don't need to get into what our feelings were about that whole deal, but the 75th led the way on that. Yeah. And oh, by the way, they'd been kind of leading the charge in Afghanistan for, you know, the better part of the last eight years as yeah, well. hundred percent. You know, hundred percent. So, um, I, I, I love a lot of things that you're saying there. The, uh, especially, I mean, the Ranger leader, let's talk about the Ranger leader, right. And then how it kind of shaped you as a leader. Uh, the Ranger leader before 9-11, uh, it was just different. Mm -hmm. It was different. It was more, it was, I mean, standards and discipline are always important, but I think they were hyper-focused pre-9-11 because that's yeah. all you really had, right? Yeah, was, was, you, yeah, All you had was dress right, dress, uh, um, equipment. I mean, all the things that are important, but it was hyper-focused back then. Like yeah. if, if your duffel bag was facing the wrong way on the top of your wall locker, you got a counseling statement, right? Yeah. Some of that stuff kind of fell off because other things took priority post-9-11. Yep. Post when I talk to people in the business world or rangers in general, I don't know if they realize how dynamic the ranger leader became during the post 9-11 years. Yeah. Uh, when you talk to business leaders, they want leaders that can be dynamic, lead through change, uh, make decisions, even though, even though the, you know, the outcome might not be apparent, you got to make a decision. Yeah. Uh, and when I hear this, I'm like, you're describing like the 20 years that the regiment was in GWAT. Right. Uh, from 21 year old kids to Sergeant Major sitting in a jock. We were doing that every single day and right. every rotation with the, the dynamic changing in the environment. Um, so how did the 75th shape you as a leader? And then, you know, how does that transition to the outside the uniform now? Yeah. God, there's so much there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot there. That's a, that's an amazing question. 
everything that I am as a leader and as a man is a result of the 75th Ranger Regiment, specifically the individuals um, and the leaders within it. You know, uh, I just recently was uh, talking to uh, Sergeant Major Albertson, retired. Yeah. You know, now he said his call sign's Chuck, <laughs> which felt very weird. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know why, but that one actually felt like the most weird. I mean, you know, General <laughs> Crystal was like, call me Stan. And I was like, okay, Stan, you know, like, you know, but Chuck, yeah, that was, that was weird. But, uh, you know, so, you know, you take leaders like Josh Wheeler, Bernie Foligno, Chuck Albertson, um, uh, uh, Daryl Thies, you know, these are major individuals, legends, you know, of the 75th, excuse the terrible pun there. Um, but these are guys that really taught me how to be a man. Correct. They taught me how to be a leader. They, they showed me what it meant to be a leader and, you know, leading by example, doing things routine, you know, routine things routinely. Um, standards matter because we need to be able to do things. We need to have expectations that are just executed without any thought process. Like we're not going to be able to go back in time and say, man, we really, really wish we had taught our guys that, hey, this aspect of weapons maintenance kit and how you set up your kit, it really, really matters when somebody's scrambling to do a mag drill you know, or, you know, mag change or grab a grenade or their weapons malfunctions, you know, because of X, you know, we can't go back in time and fix that stuff when in a critical moment, when we need something to work or we need something to happen, or we need something to be muscle memory. Like we have to train it so that it becomes that way. And it becomes part of who we are as individuals, individual Rangers and our expectations that we set as leaders so that in those critical moments, it matters. Um, and so all of that, stuff um you know but then also higher level that's very very basic level like you know those you know the why the standards matter why discipline matter why we train right. you know not to um you know to to perfection why we do that kind of stuff that's very very low level high level and what always just amazed me about those individuals, like I would, you know, I, when I would sit in meetings, the questions that first aren't our majors and some of these, you know, officers would ask, I'd be like, why, how did they think of that? Like, why didn't I think of that? Like, am I literally the dumbest guy in the room? Like, I'm not even thinking about that kind of stuff. And it, and it, and it like I've said before, I'm not, you know, the sharpest tool in the shed. It, it, what it took me a while was you have to have a curious mind. Yeah, You have to not just be in the moment, you have to be thinking through the moment, through the conversation that's actually happening and planning for contingencies. And that became super, super relevant when I was a platoon sergeant. When I was a platoon sergeant, because you know, when you're a squad leader, you're a team leader, everything's just reacting. Right. In a lot of situations, you're mostly reacting. Yes, you're you have some foresight. You're trying to think things through. You're trying to move ahead of whatever situation is going to happen. But for the most part, you're just reacting to the world as it's happened and the contacts happening around you. As a platoon sergeant, you're orchestrating things. Right. You are trying to anticipate what's going to happen before it's going to happen. One in training so that you guys are prepared for whatever's going to happen next. Um, and it just continues to grow from there. And you need to have contingency planning. You need to be not asking yourself, here's what's going to happen. Here's what could possibly happen. Right. And then if we don't think that we have the individuals trained or we don't have the equipment in the event that something like this happens, that's where we need to be. That's what I need to be thinking about. That's what I need to be asking questions about. And once I kind of realized that, and I'm going to be honest with you, it, you know, I was thrown into the role of being a platoon sergeant because Jeff Winstead was injured overseas. All of a sudden, I'm go from the, you know, the weapons squadron, I'm the platoon sergeant. Now, you know, Doug Pallister says, hey, you're just going to stay in the position as a platoon sergeant. And I did that for, you know, almost three years. And, you know, so it took about a year to kind of get my wits about me to kind of figure that stuff out. But then after that, that's really where I started to really morph into what I call, you know, you're now the train the trainer, right? You are training the guys, you are setting up the scenarios that are going to push them past their limits. And when I talk about live fires, and I talk about, you know, the, the evolution of the live fires, you know, 275, because of guys like Daryl Thies, Bernie Foligno, uh, former, um, you know, some of those, you know, uh, Carilla, you know, some of those, those, those officers as well, we really challenge the status quo. Like, okay, this is the live fire. It's going to check all the boxes, but where can we push it to the next level? What else can we incorporate in? And, 
you know, we really started to challenge things. And, you know, my fellow platoon sergeants, which are just, you know, amazing individuals, first sergeants too, they did that also. And, and, and what's funny is when you talk to um, pockets of guys that really did revolutionary things for the Ranger Regiment, like Matt Larson. Mm -hmm. For instance, you know, combatives trainer. Um, he's he's one of the he's a phenomenal example of that. What you found was there was pockets of individuals like him that had like minds that said, okay, hey, we're really, really good at what we're doing, but let's get better and let's ask different questions. Let's try new techniques. Let's spend our time and our research and everything else trying to figure out new ways of doing things. And they could throw them and test them and everything else and then bring that back to Ranger Regiment. And, you know, you talk, you know, 2007, 2008 timeframe, you know, well, two, it started in 2006. But, you know, like when we would do, you know, the Ranger Raid was blow the gate, charge, you know, run in, you know, kick in the door, get the door down however you can. And now, you know, just rapidly get as many Rangers as you can in the building, um, you know, and clear it as fast as you can. And we realized, wow, this is a terrible fucking idea. Like, <laughs> right. you know, we got guys shot in courtyards. Yeah. We had, you know, they were rigging gates. We had guys, you know, they were rigging doors. Okay, we need to do something different. You know, surreptitious breaching, multiple breach points, distraction breaching, Justin Spicer, him and I spent a lot of time talking about this. Um, you know, in our podcast and, you know, in other venues, you know, we were talking about this all the time, but like, hey, we need to try new things. Then relying on, you know, the other agencies and organizations that we were in, you know, we had the development of the call out. And I don't want to get into tactics too much here, but like, hey, we really, really need to challenge that. And it was all, I wish I had been ahead of that kind of innovative thought. But at the end of the day, it was there when I needed it to, and I changed my mind frame when I needed to. And it really honestly propelled me through the rest of the career. Not go, you know, especially when I served outside of the 75th Range Regiment, I'm faced with large organizations that go, well, Sergeant Major, this is the way we've always done it. Right. And instead of saying, you know, just something very simply, well, just because that's the way we've always done it doesn't mean that it needs to be the way. Right. Instead, because when you're a leader, a senior leader, you can just give people the answers to the test. Okay. But what you're doing is you're robbing them of professional development. Right. Instead, you need to ask questions that make them think, because what you're trying to do is you're trying to get them where you want them to be or where you wish you had been at that level as a platoon sergeant. I wish I had been thought about this, you know, this way earlier. And instead, you know, so it, what, what I tried to do when I was you know, in senior level is, is asking questions, putting scenarios in front of them that made them go, okay, I've always done it this way, but now with a little bit of an innovative thought, I can actually completely change the paradigm. And now what develops on the backside is something that's completely amazing yeah. and way better than I ever would have anticipated. You know, and then it comes into this conversation. And I'm sorry, I'm I'm rapid fired here. You gave no, me good. coffee. You gave me coffee. All right. This is your fault. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh is this conversation about, you know, evolutionary thought for re versus revolutionary thought. And if you're just evolving, it's good, but you're always, you have to come to the realization, you're always going to match the level that you need to be at. Right. You're going to match the enemy where they're at, where you're at. And it's just, you're, it, you might fall behind at times, but you're never really going to actually be out ahead of it. And what's amazing about the Ranger Regiment and what, you know, and it took us a little while, but eventually where we got was we were revolutionary in thought. Now, there's a risk when you're in revolutionary of thought or you have revolutionary thoughts or tactics or things that you're trying to do is, is sometimes they're just going to be completely asinine and stupid, right. you know, and they're going to fail and they're going to fail miserably. But the amount of them that succeed because of the talented individuals and the thing and the individuals that just make things happen um, because they're just so strong in personalities and their sheer force of will will make things happen um, is the, the, the co's outweigh the pro, uh, the cons yeah. in my opinion. Sorry. There was a ton there and I don't even, did I even, add, I don't even know what your question There's was. <laughs> so much there that I want to talk about, but you have somewhere to be today. No, no, no. You're good, man. No, you're good. I, I, I think 11 o'clock is when that is. So. Uh, exactly. That, 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 um, we're talking about Ranger leadership and, and you covered the whole gambit there. And I, I, I truly do appreciate it. It's great stuff. And it makes me realize 
you know, I didn't realize till I left. I, most yeah, things, you yeah. don't realize till you leave. <laughs> yes, I know, right? You don't right? realize till you're on the other side looking back at the collection of leaders that you've got to be around every day, mm, right? It I was know, just, right? It's just, if I was a Fortune 500 company, I would be standing at the gates of Fort Moore going, uh, it come work for me. 75th, E6 or above, let's go. Yeah, get right. In the, get in yeah, the car, yeah. man. Yeah, right. Uh, there's just, I mean, just they're just such good people. You know, they came like you, they came from nothing, hard work, uh, came to the 75th, helped the 75th evolve and change and everything that we did. And I'm going to talk directly to anybody that's out there. E6, E7, that's in that moment right now. That's saying, I think I might want to get out of the army. Mm. I think we've all had the thought as a team leader is like, mm -hmm. I never want to do anything else. Absolutely. And then I became a squad leader. I was like, I want to never want to do the yeah. job above me. And then I became a platoon sergeant. I was like, yep. this, this is, is awesome. The, this is the best job. Uh, and then, it, and that parlays every yeah. rank, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, ops are major kind of sucked, but I still, I matured so much as a leader and as a human being, as a yes. husband, as a father in every leadership role that, you know, when you get out at 39, 40 years old, you're still a young man. And if you parlay your experience of what we, what you just discussed into your civilian career, you're going to be amazing. And the regiment's doing things and putting things in place to help you do that. But don't drop it now. Don't quit now. If you like it a little bit, stay. I promise mm. you, you will not regret it. Uh, Absolutely. And we've talked a lot about the 75th. Uh, 75th shaped me as a man, right? And I'll be I learned things from th from bad leaders, right? Yeah, I, I watched bad leaders in, in the 75th and I was absolutely. like, I will never be that man, yep. right? Uh, and, and that's leadership. But there's a whole greater army that mm -hmm. I spent a little bit of time in. Uh, I was scared to leave the 75th, 75th. You led at a high level outside. There are some really good leaders in the army, too. Unbelievable. Way better than I ever was yep. or ever will be. And I didn't appreciate it till I left, right? And I got to sit around the other leaders up at 5th RTB where I was and go, this platoon sergeant in, you know, Italy would run circles around 90% of the dudes at Absolutely. 175. 100%. Uh, and I was, uh, that surprised me, right? Yeah. And, and I don't know why, just preconceived. Well, notions, it's just right? what we're told. Yeah. Like if you, if you leave Ranger, well, one, it's a punishment. Right. For the most part, more, most of your career having to go out outside of the 75th Ranger Regiment is a punishment. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> So what was your conventional army time like? Yeah. Uh, everybody I talked to say in some regards, it was more fulfilling because you yeah. got to, you had, it was just, you know, you didn't have that collection of super leaders there. You still had them, but you got to have more, more, you know, influence, if you will, on, on a greater population. What was it like for you in the, in the big army? Yeah. So uh, I want to, I want to answer that question. And, you it. know, another question too, that, you know, you asked um, that, you know, cause you sent me some stuff that you wanted to talk to about before. So I leave, you know, Ranger Regiment in 2017, or I'm sorry, 2016, go to the Star Major Academy. And this was on the advice of Albertson, Thies, uh, Felino, Bishop. They said, Hey, leave, go to the Star Major Academy. It'll be good for you. Um, you know, and then now they're CSL select, so you can go and be a CSM outside in the conventional army, and then you can apply and come back to the 75th Ranger Regiment. And they're like, that's what we think you should do. I was like, okay, cool. That's exactly what I'm going to do. These are what my mentors are going to be doing. You know, one of the questions you asked, you know, um, in your email was, you know, what's your toughest day in uniform? Yeah. Okay. Well, and <laughs> sure, there's a lot of different tough days and there's a lot of answers guys give, but I really took that question. Like I wanted to centralize it around the uniform, the, the wearing of the uniform. Okay. Uh, I wanted to take it very literal. The toughest day I ever had in uniform was when I found out that I could not ever come back to the 75th Ranger Regiment. Mm. And I, Mike Alba, love him to death. I appreciate that dude to the end of the earth because he called me personally and he said, Hey, listen, Mike, you're highly eligible to be a brigade star major. Um, we're selected two other guys to come back and, you know, take over RSTB and uh, 175. Um, so you're not coming back to be a CSM in the 75th Ranger Regiment. That was my toughest day in uniform. Yeah. The realization that I was never, ever going to touch the magic again. Yeah. Um, it really was. However, how, comma, however, I am so glad that it happened. Um, and <laughs> there's a lot of maturity, a lot of reflection. I would not change one damn thing about my time outside of the 75th Ranger Regiment. I would have loved to have come back in, you know, 275 or any one of, you know, the battalions. I would have loved to have been a CSM, but I was where I needed to be. Yeah. And I was where I needed to be personally, professionally, 
uh, family wise, everything to actually grow into the person that I needed to be. And my time was amazing. I, I did have a little bit of a tough time. My first TSM position, um, after about six or seven months, uh, just, you know, had some issues with the commander, you know, that I was serving with, but it was very quickly remedied, but the impact that I had, um, the influence that I was able to garner just by doing something that we are taught literally when they stand in that formation, they put Sergeant rank on your, on your chest, whoever it was that did it, whoever the NCO was, here's what it means to be an NCO always lead by personal example. Do that and you'll be successful as an NCO, right? And that's all I did as a CSM, mm -hmm. just led by personal example. Hey, you guys are doing this. I'm going to do it too. Sergeant Major, why are you here? Because I'm an NCO, this is my job. Yeah, but Sergeant Majors don't do this. Well, I'm not them. You <laughs> right. know, here's me and I'm going to do this, you know? And uh, I was able to just shift the mentality of an entire organization by doing that. And, you know, so... <clears throat> 18 months later, you know, I, I left that squadron, uh, that, you know, Calvary squadron that was just amazing to be a part of with strikers, uh, had tons of fun, you know, all over Europe, going all over Europe, doing all kinds of cool things personally and professionally and traveling and, you know, really important strategic mission. Oh, by the way, having a budget that would rival the 75th Ranger right. Regiment didn't suck either, you yeah, know, right. like we had a lot of money. So we were, we were able to do some really amazing things. And then, you know, uh, I was on the brigade alternate list and they selected me to be second cavalry regiments uh csm and whoa boy some of the best moments of my military career um had a commander colonel thomas thomas hove who's one of my closest friends we just did amazing things like unbelievable things across the entire theater um you know great higher command of you know general nori and uh you know, General Cavoli and uh, Sergeant Major Abernathy, like, oh, and Sergeant Major Velez. Um, you know, some people didn't like him, but I, I did, you know. Um, I really loved him because, you know, once I realized, like, it's just about matching his anger. Yeah. Like, you know, he's, like, very easy to get along yeah. with. Like, if he's really angry about something, then I just need to be equally as angry about it. And then we're, we're, we're best friends, good. you know. <laughs> like, you know, so anyway, um, it was just phenomenal. And having a commander that was just like, hey, Sergeant Major, what do you think? And I'm like, I think we should do this. And he's like, okay. You know, and then, you know, just gave me complete autonomy to do whatever I wanted to do. Um, and I thought that the organization needed to do and be a part of, you know, just anything that I thought I needed to be a part of. Hey, sir, I'm going to go to France uh, for this week. Our guys are going through this. I just think it'd be really important for me to go, you know. You know, plus I want to get some French food, you know, yeah, and he's yeah. like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, let's do that, you know, and uh, just had a had a remarkable time. Um, and it really broadened me as a leader um, because the the 75th Ranger Regiment is a leadership factory. It is a pressure cooker for leadership. The sets and reps you have to go through because of deployments and everything and just the pace it moves at, like you just figure things out very, very quickly. Yeah. And leadership things that take years for people to learn, you know, you learn in a deployment, you know, and they're just ingrained in you. Now they're part of your fiber because again, you're part of that pressure cooker. Yeah. So it just becomes ingrained in you. Okay. But you can also just get rid of anybody that's not cutting stuff. That's right. They don't meet the mental, the physical, they have a mess up, slight a character, whatever it is. You're just like, hey, man, thanks for your time. But now go to X unit, you yep. know, and you just get rid of them mm -hmm. and you don't have to mentor them. You don't have to develop them. You don't have to, you know, try to, you know, fix them. You just get rid of them because they're just a cog in the wheel and it's slowing things down and they just go bye bye, you know. And I'm not saying that everybody does that, but it's an option. You can do it, right. you know. And uh, sometimes it was easier than other times. Like I mean, you know, sometimes you could you could fire a guy on a Monday and he was wearing a black beret and he was running in Army PTs on a Thursday down the road, yep. you know, like. Um, and in the army, you can't do that. Right. You have what you have. And you've got a mentor and you've got to develop them. Yes, you can shift people around. You can move people around. Yes, you can fire people, but it isn't easy. You have, it really challenges you as a leader. Mm -hmm. You've got, and that's where vulnerability, transparency really came into play for me as a leader, where I had to go, okay, let's sit down. Let's have a conversation. You know, you're really struggling as a platoon sergeant, a section sergeant. You know, and for example, I'll give you, you know, just one example real quick. You know, one of my mortar sergeants over at my FST, which is my forward support troop, okay? 
this guy just was struggling. He's very, very lackluster. He just didn't care. Like he was just unenthused about everything. And finally, after like a platoon sergeant PT session, you know, just with all the platoon sergeants, I was like, hey, let me, let's walk to the chow hall together. You know, let's walk, let's talk, you know. And just in the course of the conversation, and I was talking about, you know, some of my struggles in the military and where I wasn't always the leader I wanted to be and I didn't show up in the way I needed to. He just told me the story. How he was, you know, 35 years old, um, owned a trucking company, huge trucking company based out of, I think it was New Mexico, you know, fleet services all around, you know, the southern, you know, southwest United States. September 11th happened and he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to, you know, go into the army. And then he was watching kids die with IEDs. He was watching Jessica Lynch convoy that happened there, all this different kind of stuff. And he goes, I think I could change something. I could, I could do driver's training. I could, cause he'd, he'd also at some point in his, in his life also done like some defensive driving with like police forces and stuff like that and everything else. Like he'd gotten some certification doing that. So he also knew about that kind of stuff. So anyway, eventually he finally liquidates his company. He sells his company, you know, um, because he got like a huge DOD contract and then was able to sell the sell the trucking company and then join the army. And what he'd always wanted to do was lead driver's training. He'd just never been able to do it. Said no one ever. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, right. <laughs> That's guy. true. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. You're not wrong, you know. But this was, you know, this was a very popular book back then, you know, at this time was, you know, start with why. Oh, yeah. This was his why. Yeah. And when I uncovered that, I said, hey, well, we need to stand up our driver's training program. He goes, I know. I've thrown my name in the hat to be the leader for it. And I was like, oh, I never heard this. You know, no one had ever told me this. You know, when I was asking somebody to volunteer for being the driver's training, I got nothing, right. you know, from the formation. And anyway, you know, over the course of time, he led standardized absolutely crushed it for the driver's training for my squadron. And then when I went up to be the regimental CSM, he became the driver's training and that was his job yeah. for the entire regiment. And he revolutionized it all. And he was motivated. He was excited. He was passionate. And that was because it fulfilled my his why. My point is, is not that we don't do that in the 75th Ranger Regiment, but you're forced to. You have no <laughs> choice in the conventional army, you got who you got and you got to deal with them and you got to find the best version of them. And that means you usually got to connect with them on just a different level. Yeah. Yeah. Again, a lot to unpack there. I, I th something I think that came to mind as you're speaking there is what, as a leader, if you, you got to put yourself in uncomfortable situations yeah. to grow, yeah, uh, leaving the 75th and going and running the units that you ran here, super yes. uncomfortable for you, but you had to get on point and learn uh, when they gave me deco, I'd never mortars, <laughs> snipers, rec, like all. I I spent years trying to stay away from them. Right, probably the best developmental time I ever had because I had to learn in the moment as we're going how to lead these these men. Right, so if you're comfortable as a leader, you're probably wrong. Right, uh, you need to move on and find something else and, and challenge yourself because you're not you're probably not uh, you're not serving the people that you need to serve to the utmost ability if you're comfortable. Um, you had, you took over the podcast, asked yourself your own question that I was going to ask you. So I, I'm, I, sorry. I I'm sorry. Appreciate it. I'm sorry, but you're not going to get totally off. Okay. But there's a flip side. Yeah. Uh, what was your best day in the uniform? I think my best day in my in the uniform was any any time I watched somebody that was super close to me get recognized. Um, yeah, sometimes it's family, you know, like your wife, your wife gets an award, you know, your son, you know, um, but then, you know, you know, this just as well as there's, there's Rangers, there's leaders, or there's people in the, in the military that become family, you know, and I'll, you know, Ray Halderson, he's pretty much like a godfather to, um, my kids. So like, you know, they call him uncle Ray. Um, whenever I see him, or whenever I've been part of any of his promotion ceremonies, when he's gotten promoted, when he put on first R rank, like literally the proudest moments of my life. Um, and the reason I think it is, is because you just knew that you're a part of that guy's journey, um, that individual's journey. And it was just, it was just remarkable to be a part of. And then the, the, the most relevant exam or the most relevant 
good time in uniform was my last day in uniform. Not, not because I was like, yeah, peace is out. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Right. No, that wasn't the reason. The reason was, is because as I spoke at my ceremony, as I looked out in the formations, as I looked at my wife, man, wow, whew, this is going to hit me a little bit. Um, I just realized what I got to be a part of That's right. for That's 25 right. years. And I remember standing in front of my, you know, the mirror, the first time I put on that uniform, you know, remember when you're trying oh, yeah. to mod and basic there, I don't care who you are. The first time you put on that uniform in basic training and you stood in front of the mirror, you're like, oh yeah, I'm, yeah. A, I'm a goddamn keg sniper, you know, sniper <laughs> freaking seal. Like, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm a bad mofo, you yeah. know, every single one of us did that. Right. And my point being is, is I just... Stating there in uniform, I realized the momentum thing, monumental thing that I got to be a part of in my career, the amazing individuals that I met, served with, bled with, you know, accomplished just unreal things. And the man that stands here now is because of all of them. And I get to, and this is a big thing for me, I get to live my life now. Right. And there's so many that don't. Right. There's right. so many that we know that don't get, you know, you know, 11 o'clock, we're going to a dedication ceremony for Chris Domey, the fire center down in Fort Moore, you know, he doesn't get to. Right. And, you know, so, and I get to, I, I lived, right. We, we lived through all of that. I mean, God dang, that's amazing in itself. Right. Yeah. You know? And uh, so that was, you know, my most relevant, just like I was on, I was just overcome with, with emotion and pride and just like, wow. Yeah. Goddamn. Being an American soldier, being a, you know, a ranger. Yeah. What, what, how amazing is that? Yeah. That, that's awesome. It's a similar, similar, similar thoughts for me. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I still find it today. Like the, where you said you, seeing somebody else succeed is uh, yeah. when I see one of my former platoon sergeant or first sergeant peers pin on and then they walk in front of a battalion and they're now yeah. battalion sergeant majors, or they go and they're a chief of staff somewhere. And I'm like, <laughs> we're cut from the same cloth, bro. Right. I, mean, I, yeah. I am so proud to, to not, I don't know you well, but I know where you've been. Yeah. And, uh, I know, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. The people we had around us and it's amazing every day. I'm getting emotional. Just seeing, yeah. I love seeing people that did what we did for 20 years, be successful. Yeah. yeah they're in the uniform or out of the uniform. I, I just love it. it. gets, gets me going. I um, agree. Uh, so that perfect. Let's move on to the yeah. to the transition. Yeah. Uh, you transitioned as you know senior NCO, senior yeah. to the senior, right? Uh, yeah. The gray hair shows it. <laughs> uh, but 20, 24 years. Yeah. Um, we could probably talk a lot about it, but I think what we should kind of hone in is what are some of the hard truths you know a senior NCO who's done everything in the military needs to you know face when they're when they're stepping out. Yeah, a couple things. One is the army's going to be fine without you, <laughs> right? And, and and maybe in some ways they're going to be better without you, right? And I don't mean that you're it's because you're a piece of crap. It's because that's the army has to move on. Right. The unit. The reason we change commands, the reason we change responsibilities, is because you come in, you do a bunch of things, um, but eventually you kind of outlive your totality for that organization. And they need to have a new leader that comes in with new fresh set of eyes uh, that doesn't have biases and go, okay, here's some of the new problems that the other guy didn't even identify. It's not that he's a bad person. You right. just, you fix the things, you become partial to the things that you fix and it's time for you to move on. And they're going to be probably better for it that you moved on. You know, that's yeah. just the army keeps on rolling along as the song goes, it's you know? Back, yeah. Um, and just realizing that the army can do fine without you. You don't, they don't need you. And if you think they do, man, I, there's, there's some more psychological issues than, you know, any of us could probably unpack there. Um, and then the second thing is, is it is going to be awesome. Yeah. It is going to be okay. That doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. That doesn't mean it's going to be clean, but the things that made you successful in the army are going to make you successful outside too. But I've done that a lot. I've done that like four times now. I've done the but, yeah, you know. Because like, there is a but always. But there is, a, yeah, I guess there is always a but. Um, it is not about who you know. Hmm. Who you know, that's great. You know, you know, I mean, 
I could sit here and I could say, well, I can call General Crystal. Cool. Right. Great. Yeah. That's phenomenal that you can call that guy. Like no, no one gives a shit, right? Just because you know somebody means nothing. Here's what it's really actually about. This is something that life's taught me. It's about who's willing to make a phone call on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Who is willing to pick up the phone and go, hey, you should really look into Mike Burke um, for this job or to make a connection for you um, because of X, Y, and Z reason and speak, you know, your name, you know, scream it from a rooftop. That's actually who matters. However, when we're in Ranger Regiment, when we're in the brown fence, we're very good at networking. We're yeah. very good at building those connective tissues, getting things done and everything else. We spend no time doing it outside of that. I had the fortune of serving outside of the 75th Ranger Regiment. And then more importantly, because of podcasts, because of other things and just other things that I was doing, it was just, you know, kind of circumstance. It wasn't necessarily by design. I was able to build all this connective tissue around my, myself and, you know, really flex a network and build a network of individuals on social media, outside of social media, all over the place and really forge relationships that when I needed something or they needed something, we had a mutual kind of agreement that we could call one another and ask, you know, hey, will you make a phone call to this individual? Hey, will you? And it takes practice and it takes a lot of effort um, to do it. And so anybody that is transitioning, one way that I would really start to do it is, is something, and I think Michael Quinn's a guy's name. He talked about it a very long time ago, but it's like this 10, five, one rule. Um, basically every single day, do it for 30 days, connect with 10, you know, hit connect, you know, connect with 10 new people every single day on LinkedIn, comment on five, um, uh, post, you know, social media post of some kind that somebody puts on LinkedIn. Okay. And, you know, have meaningful content, you know, say something and post once. Okay. Every single day do that. All right. And do it for 30 days. LinkedIn is actually a great resource. It's great. a phenomenal resource Absolutely. and you can really kind of build. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of my transition. A lot of that actually became because of LinkedIn. Right. Like it really honestly became kind of LinkedIn. Um, so it's an existing technology that, it, that it's out there that you really, really kind of utilize for your benefit. Because when you get on the outside, I mean, I just try to think for myself, if I had not done all this and then I got on the backside, um, I, I don't know what I'd be doing right now. Right. Um, I'd probably be doing um, something that would be very comfortable. Right. Um, and I don't mean that. But you might hate it. Right. Right. Exactly. You know, so, um, you know, so, you know, you got to spend time, you Absolutely. know, uh, with, you know, as the saying goes, I'll put it in a ranger way. Xville's always planned half ass. <laughs> right. And after you unpack 25, 26, 30 years of the army, you better spend a lot of time probably the last two years of military service planning for the x -Fil. Yep. Absolutely. You're right. I, I want to, I'm going to hit two points there, which you said is, uh, what I like to say is have a network of people that will say your name in rooms that you are not in. Yes. They're going to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's a good way to say it too. Um, because that, you got to have other people out there advocating for you. And a great example, I had somebody connect with me on LinkedIn because they said, I heard your name on a podcast from Mike Burke. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. now you're in my network because I think it's exactly what Oh, yeah. I did a shout out to, to your salty bets. Yeah. On, so, uh, I mean, too. Yeah. Uh, do that. And then when I talk to people that are getting out, you know, I say, at some point in your military career, when you were going through Ranger selection and all that stuff, there was a no quit mentality. Like you, yeah. you've got to reharness that on it. Like, I had no me like you were never going to walk to the fire. That was just not going to happen. You were going to do whatever it took to get through rip rasp. That person is still inside of you. Mm. Be that person until, you know, you, you find your, find your happiness. And, and you're right. I, I see it, especially being here at Benning. I see a lot of people walk out on Friday and walk back in on Monday as a GS, whatever, in the same three shop that they just were working in. <laughs> yeah. And I'll be honest, when I talk to most of those guys outside, they're absolutely miserable and just yeah. unhappy. So find something that you love. Uh, and you're right. Use li LinkedIn's there. I mean, it's, it's a amazing. free resource uh, yep. that you can get for free for a year. And oh yeah, we, premium. Yep. We could talk about that, that, that forever. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about your, more about your transition and Leadership as a whole, you're in a leadership role now at Northern Rock doing what you're doing as a chief of staff. How did you, how did your military leadership transition over? Did you take all of it? Is it all useful? Did you have to dump some of it? Uh, um, how do you translate it? 
everything yep. there. How does that, you know, 24 years of doing this translate into what you do now? Yeah. And it, you know, this is where it comes down to the, the struggle factor, you know, that we were talking about is, is, uh, it's not been clean and it's not been pretty. Um, because we're very comfortable, you know, as senior leaders in the army about making decisions, um, you know, and, and driving the ball forward and, uh, you know, just being very direct with people, pointed with people and trying to get things done. Right. And, you know, in the civilian sector, what you have to realize is, is that, you know, in my role as a chief of staff, I'm not actually the decision maker. I'm the, you know, the individual that's supposed to, you know, help formulate thoughts, you know, decisions and all this different kind of stuff so that the CEO can make the decisions. Um, and I had to, so I did, you know, think about this and I put a lot of thought into this, you know, prior to assuming the position. So, and then I'm also stepping into a role that I know nothing about. You know, when we talk about private equity and, you know, uh, you know, roll up concept that we do for the auto service station. Um, I don't know anything about it, you know, from the numbers, the math, how the market affects things, you know, how the operation side of it actually even works. Um, you know, it was something I just didn't know. So there was a lot of listening. There was a lot of stepping into a room and sitting down with individuals and going, okay, I'm the dumbest person in here about this subject. Okay. I don't know anything they're about to talk about. So I'm just going to take a lot of notes. And then tonight I'm going to be sitting down and doing a lot of Google. Um, I'm going to be asking a lot of questions, follow-up questions, emails, you know, sideline conversations and really learning what the hell everybody is talking about. You know, and I remember telling the CEO, I was like, Hey man, you're going to need to give me, you know, about, you know, two weeks to 30 days to really kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, and that sounds cool. That sounds great. He's like, yeah, absolutely. No problem. You know, but this is a very rapidly growing company that yeah. is doing a lot of things. Um, we actually, in the time that I came into the position and then, you know, the first like 60 days we grew, you know, uh, exponentially and then we continue to grow. So while that sounded cool, the truth of it was, is I didn't have time. I had to learn in flight. I had to put things into flight like immediately that I just learned and I just figured out sometimes acting maybe a little bit like I know what I'm talking about um, just so I could carry a conversation and then, you know, just keep the ball rolling. Um, but, you know, checking your ego, being humble and uh, willing to learn was was very important. And then also admitting, hey, you know, I messed this up. Uh, I made the wrong decision. Um, I made a decision you know, or I, you know, contacted the wrong individual or whatever happened, you know, and just, you know, be in forefront with it. And, uh, you know, but keep on moving forward, keep on growing, uh, finding mentors, uh, networks, you know, that's a huge thing that I had to do too, because the whole chief of staff concept, you know, we all have preconceived notions about what it actually is in the military In the civilian sector is very different, completely different, you know, so I reached out and, you know, got connected. I, I think I, got into about three or four different chiefs of staff network, rapidly got rid of three of them. Like these are no value added. These are terrible. And then now have one that I'm tied into uh, that's just phenomenal. Um, a really good group of individuals, uh, very, very intelligent all around the globe uh, doing some remarkable things, you know, and I'm like, okay, cool. You know, and recently just actually got to go to an event, uh, you know, a four day event that they had up in Boston and it was just cool. It reminded me now, Okay, you know, use your imagination here a little bit here, but it just reminded me of like sitting around with a bunch of platoon sergeants or sergeant majors that were all facing the same struggles, we're all facing the same frustrations, um, and we're just able to sit around and talk about it, right. you know, and work through it and offer solutions to each other. And it reminded me of that because they're chief of staffs from around the world, right. you know, and they're all in their own kind of way facing the same things. Yeah. So do you think the uh – like the chaos that you that we have to deal with in the military with the rapid involvement, like the yeah. 75th there, especially like you think like the 2006 to 2009 era yeah. where things were changing, to, you know, day by day, hour by hour in some cases. Yeah, absolutely. Did you find yourself, hey, I'm, you're drinking from the fire hose again trying to, but did that time in the army like help yeah. you yeah. maybe slow down that moment and say, pick out, I need to focus on this and this, did that thing? Yeah. I mean, you know, it goes into the adage that, you know, you always look for the leader that in a, a moment of chaos is calm and cool, collected, right? right? You know, so when everybody was freaking out, losing it and, you know, the end of the world, the sky is falling, you know, just again, you know, absolutely just being that guy like, well, 
I've dealt with some big deals before, and this isn't one of them. Right. So let's unpack this. Let's talk about it. Let's let's see, you know, what the bigger parts are, and uh, what can we control in the moment? What can we put into place in the moment to move us forward, move the ball forward? And then let's look at it from a systematic perspective of how do we prevent, you know, whatever issue, whatever problem, or whatever lesson needs to be learned, um, so that we can have something that actually develops it and uh, makes it happen in the future. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And then there's just more. So when I talk to people and they bring up your name, uh, we talked about this a little bit off air. They always kind of point to like, how did Mike do it? Right? He's got the chief of staff. You know, you got a chief yeah. position yeah. In, in front of you, a C, C position. Uh, I think there's some misconceptions either from lieutenant colonels and sergeant majors above that that's automatic. Like you're going to walk into that yeah. spot when you get out of the military. And that's not true. You've got to do your research. You got to find the fit. You got to see where you can fit in. Uh, how did you parlay all of your military experience your, what you learned in transition into the position you have now and, and what, what advice would you give somebody? Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a good question. And it, you know, to back it up just a little bit, you know, so when we talk about the whole chief of staff, that was not even something that was on my radar. When we go to about what well, it's October. No, it's November. Jesus. It's November. I know. Okay. So a little, maybe about 15 months ago, right. When I'm really, really now it's down to game time. What am I going to do on the other side of retirement? Like hard conversations, right? And I just, I had some ideas. I had some things that I thought I was going to do, some jobs that I was going to do, companies I was going to apply for. And they're all ones that we all know about, you know, that we all have worked for yeah. or we know individuals that work for. Those were all in the rubric, right? Our Rolodex, sorry, wrong word. And I, but I was like, but I, I want to see, I want to create as many options. It's no different than when I tell, talk to a guy. I've never talked to anybody ever about reenlisting. I've never talked to anybody in reenlisting. I've always, always talked to them about options. Just lay out all your options. So that's what I did. I was like, I need to lay out as many options. And I just started having a lot of conversations with people, asking them what they thought. People that are very near and dear to me, what do you think I should do? What do you, what would you recommend I do? Okay. And eventually it kind of came to this point with a very old commander of mine. Um, long time ago, uh, Greg Harkins, he goes, Hey, I've got a guy that he's looking for a chief of staff. You know, he's a, you know, CEO of a department underneath a, you know, a bunch of other CEOs and he's looking for a chief of staff. You should apply for the position. It's not advertised. It's nothing. I was like, okay, cool. Um, can you make the connection? You know, so he made the connection and then it started this whole, as I like, cause again, I had the preconceived notion of what a chief of staff is. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, I have no idea what a chief of staff does in the civilian sector. And as I started doing research, I started looking into it. I started reaching out to people that I knew were chiefs of staff, which there's not many, even, you know, in the civilian sector that are prior military. There's not a lot. In fact, the one that I talked to the most is uh, J.C. Glick, Mm -hmm. you know. I was like, wow, actually, this role makes a lot of sense for a non-commissioned officer, especially a sergeant major. Like, a lot of the things that is expected of a chief of staff is very much what we do, especially when you talk about a startup company and you talk about culture of an organization, right? And so then I was like, okay, now I'm going to go down this chief of staff pipeline. And I lined up a shitload of interviews, a bunch of resumes. I Again, I'm going to create as many options. I made a lot of phone calls, created an entire spreadsheet of all the jobs, you know, and I did a total of 29 interviews. Um, so a lot of them for chief of staff. And of course, because this is the world's a funny way of working, I run into this guy at a, one of my last military events that I ever went to. It was a command forum for SVAP. And there's a National Guard component that was there. There was this battalion CSM that was there. And he came up to me and him and I were talking and he was telling me about this business. We were talking and, you know, at dinner and everything else. I was like, wow, that's that's really interesting. You know, that's really interesting business. And uh, then two weeks later, he reached out to me on LinkedIn, <laughs> on LinkedIn. And he goes, hey, uh, I really like to sit down and talk to you more about you taking a role with my company. I was like, oh, OK. Um, and, you know, I'd had a bunch of, you know, I'd had I, there was probably about I would say four options that had lined up at job options I'd lined up at that point. Uh, two that were really solid, though, if I'm being honest, like two, I was like, I, one, I was like, I'm not going to do this. I'm just, but I'll be do it. Cause I need the practice. I need to do the right. interviews. One was like, I'm not working for that dude. <laughs> like, I'm not like, there's no less like, it's just that a ridiculous amount of money. I'm not going to go work for this guy. Right. And, uh, 
So we went up, we sat around, we had lunch. He very smart, very smart. He brought this guy named uh, Matt Batchelor to uh, lunch with us, former Ranger FSO <laughs> that's in the private sector doing a bunch of acquisition stuff. Uh, he brought him to lunch, you know, so we were able to talk and, you know, reminisce and all this. And then came up, did another interview. And then he said, hey, I, I, I want you to be my chief of staff. And I was like, huh, well, that's funny because I've been thinking about being a chief of staff, <laughs> you know, and uh, in the end, um, you know, after the new year, after I retired, uh, you know, I kind of had some time, had some moments, cleared my head and everything. I went, okay, I got these job offers. Um, there's still some others that I can pursue, uh, but do I need to pursue them? Or, you know, what one makes the most sense? Which one's most aligned with what I want to do, what I said I was going to do. And this one is the one that will give me the most out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. This is also the one that's the riskiest, but there's no reward without risk. Right. This is one of my pursuit. Um, and that's what I did. And, but also I want to, hey, yes, I stepped into a C-level position, but when I started with the company, it was not very big. Right. Okay. I mean, it was big. Don't get me wrong. You know, I had right at about 240 employees, but that's not very big. Right? It's not a multi-billion dollar company. I'm not working for a multi-billion dollar company yet. Yet, you know, but- yeah. Um, you know, so the chief of staff role while see, you know, it was, it was a smaller company. Now I will obviously say we're a huge company, you know, we're rapidly growing by the end of the year. I mean, it's going to be four times the size of it when I started, right. you know, but, uh, you know, it, to be a ranger was very hard. You had to do a lot. Mm -hmm. A lot of it was physical. You're going to have to work your ass off. Nothing is going to be handed to you on a plate. Okay. If you want something, you want to start a business, you want to um, go and pursue a new path, you're going to have to work your butt off on it. However, most of us, it's not that simple because we have families, we have mortgages, we have all this different kind of stuff. So my advice is if you're thinking about getting out of the army in the next five years, do everything you can to pay off everything that you have, create as much of a slush fund as you possibly can so that you're not rushed to a decision when you step outside the uniform, yeah. that you have the time and the space, you can do whatever you want. Um, you know, as long as you do that and you create that for yourself, then when you're on the other side, you can pause and you can go, what is it I want to do? What aligns with my passions, my goals, and my objectives for my life? And be clear of all the fog that the military creates for you and really make a decision that's the best for you that you're going to be happy with. 100%. 100%. Uh, well, uh, uh, again, a lot there. That's really good, though. And I think, how do you, some transition's a job. Right? Yes. You have spreadsheets, you're making calls, you're talking to people. Um, it's, uh, it, and you have to approach it with that mentality of, you know, this is a, uh, I mean, there's just a, a lot there and it networking, I mean, cliche, yeah. it's kind of become a cliche term. Yeah. I don't believe that. I think it's the most important thing it you can the, do. It is the most important thing. And it's, thing it's, it's, it's what I found. It's never Mike. It's who Mike knows that connects me. It's yes. not that first network. It's that second and third network that eventually ends up working out for you. So the more first you have, yes, then you're going to get deeper in the second and thirds. Uh, yeah. And uh, I mean, let's beat the dead horse. LinkedIn is there people. Yes. Senior NCOs, senior leaders. Uh, that's where they are. Yep. Uh, that's where the recruiters can go to. I mean, yep. uh, get on there, build your network, uh, it, and, and treat it as a job. And like you said, I think, um, don't rush to it, uh, pay off the debt. Yep. Do you really have to work the yeah. next Monday? Do you have to, right? Yep. Uh, I think it's definitely more important to be happy than it is to be, you know, uh, do something you're going to hate and then have to transition, do another transition inside of a transition. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff we could unpack about it, but uh, you got to do your homework. Yep. Um, you're not, not everybody's going to walk into a C position, but you found the one that fit that yep. was going to challenge you, but wasn't going to break you and not make you, you know, yep. that you were going to succeed. Uh, um, it's all about setting yourself up for success and we could talk about it forever. Um, as we kind of bring the plane in to land here, let's yeah. talk a little bit about you and what you're doing now outside of chief, yeah. chief Sergeant major. So you started this little thing, legends of the 75th podcast, which I was honored to be a, um, yeah. to, to be on there in, in, in the first season. Uh, what is it? Why do you do it? Yeah. What, what's, uh, why, why we tell these stories? Why are stories important? Yeah. I, well, 
So one, I want to say, you know, Legends of the 75th, you know, there's a little bit of a false misnomer and there's like people that'll go, oh man, that's awful pretentious that you called it that. Listen, it's not necessarily about the individual, although I will make the argument that McChrystal, Hall, you know, some of the individuals that we have on, yeah, they're damn right. They're Legends of the 75th Ranger Regiment, JSOC and USASOC. You're absolutely right. They've earned that, you know. Um but it's more about the 75th Ranger Regiment as a whole, yeah. the organization as a whole, and the individuals it has produced. Because let's just be honest, the nature of the organization is why we have the individuals that we have. If they had not stepped into that position, would they be who they are? Sure. But probably not in the same way that we see them, you know? And I started it because we had another podcast, Always in Pursuit, and I noticed this trend every time I had a ranger. Whoops, sorry. Every time I had a ranger on, they'd be like, hey, you should have this ranger on. You should have this ranger on. And before long, it was like, well, if I just did a podcast that was just – or if I just did rangers, it would be a ranger podcast. And then that started the conversation. And between you know guys like you know uh, Jericho Denman, um, another creative designer, uh, Corey Kress, who's a good friend of mine, not a ranger, but uh, you know my wife, you, you know, a lot of other individuals, they're like, yes – like there's an appetite, there's a need. We need to tell Ranger stories. We need to talk and focus on that. Um, I originally wanted to start it on October 1st of, uh, uh, I think it was 2001 was when we were originally going to launch the podcast. And we ran into a bunch of issues, timing, you know, all this different kind of stuff. And we started it. 21. You know, yeah, 21. Yeah, yeah. And we started it in 22, okay. you know. And now, you know, we're 44 episodes deep. And really what it is about is it's about capturing Ranger history from the first person perspective. Mm -hmm. There is yet to be an episode where I have one been sitting down with a guest and we've talked about something and I go, I had no idea about that. Yeah. I had no idea that that happened. Yeah. I completely different perspective, even though I was there in that moment, that is something that I had no idea that happened in that perspective. Um, but it's also just connective tissue yeah. for a moment. People get to relive being in the 75th Range Regiment, they get to relive it with an individual that they probably looked up to, they epitomized, um, you know, and it just reconnects everybody. Um, and there's going to be a lot more things we're going to be doing in 2024. Um, you know, uh, we're spending a bunch of time, a bunch of money, uh, kind of building out a whole plan for 2024 uh, so that we can give a lot back to the Ranger community. Um, and that is actually the larger focus of the seven or the legend of the 75th podcast is to take care of Rangers, capture their stories and provide something back to the larger community while not being a drain on the 75th range regiment. Right. I never, ever want to be a drain on the 75th range regiment. I just want to give stuff back to the individuals uh, that served within it. And also the nonprofits that exist out there, because that was a part of the conversation as well as people were like, do not start another nonprofit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you want to give money to the nonprofits, go ahead and do that. Yeah. You know, so yeah. Uh, I think uh, that's amazing. I, I love what you're doing there. Um, there's people out there who don't like it. Uh, I can tell, go screw yourself. Just yeah. be blunt. Uh, <laughs> I joined the military and the 75th Ranger Regiment because of stories. Yes, absolutely. However, somebody else was telling the story for them. Yeah. We need to tell our own freaking story. Yeah, absolutely. That way it's told right. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing missed in uh, development yeah. or production. Uh, tell your own story. Yeah, uh, I'm reading those Lurs, those Lurs books. Oh back yeah, in the day. absolutely. Mean, that the ones that they wrote. Yeah, um, we got to tell our story. It's a recruiting mechanism. It's a retention mechanism. It's a therapy mechanism. It's, absolutely. Uh, it's it's everything. It's going to get at the twenty two a day. Uh, it's going to help people find jobs. It's 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 an amazing thing. We're and uh, like I said. Uh, you can be a quiet professional, but if you're a silent professional, yeah, you're gonna big you're gonna end up uh, hurting yourself or others. So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, well, I didn't cover the story piece. You know why that's important. I'm sorry, I forgot about that part of the question. But like you think about you know humans as as an evolution, you know, and as we've come up as a species, stories is integral to yeah. our development. We pass down lessons learned, stories, um, tales, and everything else through stories. We are conditioned to process stories, you know. Um, and you know, there's simple exercises that people can actually do to see the power of stories. You know, your wife gives you a shopping list. She just says, "Hey, get twelve eggs, you know, three apples, you know, all this different." You're gonna forget probably all of it, you all know, it, yeah. especially with us with TBI. But if you tell it in the form of a story. Like, hey, you know, I need you to pick up 12 eggs. The reason that 12 is significant, you know, when you tell a story behind all this stuff, like people will just, they'll remember it yep. because it's part of our conditioning as human beings. And 
being successful as a human species is because of the stories and lessons learned and the adages that we provided. The 75th Range Regiment and the stories that encompass it, they need to be captured. Yeah. I would give everything that I could ever have to sit down with World War II Rangers Absolutely. and ask them about the lessons they learned, the stories and everything else and have it so that I can refer to it in any time. Yeah. 50 years from now, people are going to be asking the same thing about the yeah. GWAT Rangers. Yeah. What's the most, what's the most in fact, impactful moment when you watch Band of Brothers? It's the three minutes before the show starts where they talk to the person who was there. Yes. That's yeah. when the skin crawls yeah. and you go, You're man. Not, yeah. I, and I'm thankful yep. for those guys that did that episode, that, that series, not yeah. for the series, but for the three minutes before the 10 episodes that aired, right? Yeah. You And people don't understand how important it is to be able to tell your story because when you go to the job interview, uh, when you're trying to connect with your kids and tell them about what you did for 20 years, if you can't convey it, you're not going to get the job. You're, yeah. you're not going to, you're going to lose connection with the kids. You have to, you have to share that side of the story. It's so important and I can't beat that dead horse enough. Uh, but you didn't stop there. You're an author now. Well, that, I'm right? a, I'm a co-author. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, so. Well, there's author, right? The co, <laughs> you can, well, it doesn't matter. Tell, tell us a little bit. Yeah, about yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I had the opportunity and I actually brought this for you. I had the opportunity, Steve Leonard, uh, you might've heard of Steve Leonard. Um, he goes by the name doctrine man. Uh, oh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, he's, he's pretty famous in that, but he's, uh, they've been working on numerous books, uh, for probably the last decade. They've done tons of them, uh, to boldly go was the last one, but I had an opportunity to co-author, uh, a section of this book, a chapter of this book called power up. Definitely recommend everybody get it. I know I'm geeking out here a little bit, but really what it is, is they're using science fiction or like other, you know, like in this case, it's superheroes to, teach leadership lessons, to talk about character issues, to talk about, you know, conflict or societal problems that are going on, but they mask it in a story about a stupid, you know, the superheroes or, you know, what the superheroes come and, you know, overcome. So my chapter, you know, is talking about Batman. Oh, nice. And it's about imposter syndrome oh. is really what it's about and how he's actually a reluctant leader uh, that had to overcome some kind of trauma, but that trauma is actually what defined him as a leader. So uh, if you haven't got a chance, you know, you haven't saw it, definitely please go get Power Up. There's amazing authors in here as well. Um, you know, you got Augustine Cole as well, uh, Mick Ryan, uh, another one. And I know this will probably resonate uh, with uh, the Ranger community because I, th I feel like a lot of Rangers read this book, Max Brooks. The, survive, uh, the Apocalypse Survival oh, yeah. Guide for Zombies. Yes, yeah. So he he wrote in this book as well. And then you got Steve Leonard. Just tons of good books, but I also wanted to bring you a copy as well. So, you know, please go, uh, you know, get power up. Um, and all uh, all the proceeds and everything else for the go to a, uh, go to a uh, charitable donation. I can't remember what it is. I totally blanked. I'll uh, follow up and you can put it <laughs> in. I'll put it in the comments. Yeah, we'll I'll put it in, in the, the comments, comments of yeah. where all the proceeds are going to. So the authors don't make any money off of it. Awesome. I uh, appreciate you coming on, doing the show. Uh, thanks for what you do. Uh, thank you for your service. Thanks, and man. I think from one service member to another, that kind of, it means more now than I ever would have thought, you know, when I was wearing uniform. Thanks for what you did all those years. Uh, keep telling the stories. Uh, it, it, it matters. It truly matters. And for all, of you, for all of you out there listening, watching, like, share, subscribe, do all those things I need you to do. And then go check out uh, Legends of the 75th. And power up. Uh, I'm sure you won't regret it. Uh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. And we'll catch you guys on the next episode. Thank you, Yuma.